Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to today's presentation for the Northern Latitudes Landscape Conservation Cooperative webinar series. And the Northern Latitudes includes five landscape conservation cooperatives across Alaska and Western Canada, and I'm with the North Pacific LCC. And today I'm pleased to introduce Meredith Pochart, who will be presenting the Southeast Alaskan Hooligan Population Monitoring and Climate Vulnerability Assessment Project today. And I'd like to, if you could please mute your phones, that would be very helpful so then, um, for this presentation. Anyway, prior to the efforts that began with this project in 2010, there was little to no hooligan population data for this region. And so the North Pacific LCC and the Alaska Climate Science Center were pleased to be able to partner on this project starting in 2013. Meredith is the Executive Director of the Tak Chinook Watershed Council, and she began working on the hooligan project with the Chilkoot Indian Association and the Chak Chinook um, Watershed Council in 2011. She has been also working with the Oregon State University to integrate the use of eDNA data collection methods. And Meredith is pursuing a MS in fishery science through OSU as part of this project. I'd like to remind you about some upcoming webinars presented by the Northern Latitudes Landscape Conservation Cooperatives. And on Tuesday, November 28th, if you could please join partners from the Northwest Boreal LCC and the Beacons Project to learn about a new approach for proactive planning and adaptive management in the context of uncertainty and change across Alaska and Northwest Canada. And then on Tuesday, December 12th, please join us for a webinar on the U.S. Forest Service Interior Alaska Forest Inventory Analysis Program. So again, thank you for joining us today to hear Meredith's presentation. And I will turn it over to her at this time. And I want to remind you also the, the um, webinar is being recorded, and so you'll be able to access it later on. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mary. And yeah, thanks, everyone, for, for joining us today. Um, I'm going to switch over to the presentation slides. OK. Yeah, so as Mary said, this project was looking at Ulicon, which is also kind of referred to as hooligan, or the clinket term is stock, population monitoring, and climate vulnerability assessments in Haines. And as Mary mentioned, this is a partnership project between the Chilku Indian Association, Takshinuk Watershed Council, and Oregon State University. And um, on this introduction slide here, if you look in the background, I believe that was the 2013 run. Um, it was a massive run in the Chilkoot River near Haines. And yeah, it was just so, um, a pretty exciting run that year. Um, okay, so we'll get into it. What we're going to talk about today is just a little overview of the species. Um, hooligan, which I'll, I, throughout the slide, I kind of refer to back and forth between Yulikan and Hooligan, um, but they're, they're the same thing. But they're a pretty little known species. And so we'll just kind of bring everyone up to speed on the importance of hooligans, uh, the methods that we're using for the population study, and the results of the population study so far, and then the climate assessment that we conducted. So, hooligans are an anadromous smelt species. They typically spawn early spring, correlates to, to late April to early May. Um, there was some commercial harvest for hooligan in southern southeast uh, Ketchikan area, and there was previous commercial harvest in Washington, Oregon, and California, um, although not currently. There is no, because there is no commercial harvest in northern southeast Alaska, there is no regulation over the harvest. It's a strictly subsistence fishery, so no state or federal agency that monitors the species, and um, and that kind of led us to to really want to develop some sort of long-term population trend so that we can document um, in with the species. So this is the the range of Yulikan. As you can see, they, they go from northern California all the way through the Aleutians, um, and, and they're they vary a lot in their timing throughout that range, but um, that is their traditional range. One of the things that 
made us most interested in Hooligan was in 2010, they were listed as threatened, or sorry, the Southern Distinct Population of Washington, Oregon, and California was listed as threatened. And not coincidentally, that is also the year that we began the, the mark recapture population estimate on the Chilkoot River. Um, because, as I mentioned, there's, there's not a commercial fishery, there's no regulation. Um, the local tribes there really were concerned about kind of maybe some perceived declines, but with no actual population baseline or no, no monitoring even happening, there was some real need um, that was brought about through the, the tribe that, um, that we need to be monitoring this. And so, um, yeah, so why, why you look at? Um, it's a, a very important native subsistence species, has been for generations. This is a big reason why the Clinkets in Southeast became so powerful as a, as a tribe. Um, the Grease Trail was the trade route between interior tribes, and that was um, named the Grease Trails for the hooligan oil that was traded between um, coastal tribes and inland tribes. And so their subsistence focus is um, very important. They also have a very high ecological importance. Um, they're a major feeder fish, feeder fish for marine mammals, um, also seabirds. A lot of the, that life back to the region after a long winter. Um, and in this study in 2004 with singular womble and um, they documented that hooligan provides this really important food resource um, for stellar sea lions to go into their, their pupping season right before they give birth. And it provides the, the females with this important oil, um, oil and fat rich food source that allows them to make it through that pupping season and provide for lactation for the pups. So um, a really important food source ecologically and um, culturally. So um, some of the, the methods that we use um, are pretty, pretty simple. It seems simple now at the time. I think it was still a learning curve, but um, a pretty straightforward marker capture estimate uh, only on the Chilkoot River, by 10. Um, since then, we've branched out a bit, um, looking at more of the the regional aspects of hooligan, unlike um, salmon, it is thought that hooligans don't necessarily return exactly to their natal stream here to spawn. Um, they'll choose a river from within a region. And so that's when we branched out to look at more of a regional approach. And that's when we catch per unit effort um, and eDNA methods. And we're working to determine what would be the most cost-effective method when we're working on a region like we are now within 10 rivers. Um, what is cost-effective and what is most practical in many different situations? That's what we're, we're working to define now. And in this photo, you see a, this is the, the trap that we use, the kind of the mouth of the Chilkoot River. And this is where hooligan are captured in that trap. The adipose fin is clipped. They're re-released, and then upstream, we recapture them to determine how many um, clips first unclip, unclipped fish we find. A um, map showing that a little bit clearer, but as you see down um, the southern part of the map, that's where the, the trap was, that's um, where the initial clip happens, and further up we have the recapture reach um, within that zone. Crews go through and dip net or cast net fish um, or go through specifically caught fish. And their recapture numbers. So this is just what happens on the Chilkoot River. Um, on other rivers, as I said, we're branching out and using some alternative methods. Mark recapture is a very cost um, costly method. It's two crews of five people, so ten people each year to, to do this. And um, we never know when the fish are going to show up, so it makes it well just on standby at any at a moment's notice to come and help count fish. Um, but this is some of what the, the clipping 
person looks like. Um, we kind of we call this clip the shark fin clip. We found that this is the most distinguishable when we're going through lots of fish for recapture. We kind of just have this um, easy to to get that as you're counting many many fish. And this is what the recapture looks like. Folks are dip netting and counting, um, going through fish. What some of the data looks like. So as I said, we started in 2010. Um, 20, yeah, 2011 was the, sorry, I think I misspoke at the beginning when I said that that initial slide was 2013, that was 2011 that we had the 12.6 million. We also had a, a return around 12.6 for last year. Um, and that kind of is shown a little clearer in this graph here. Um, but as you can also see in this graph, we've seen some, some big variation returns. It is thought that hooligan are about four to five years when they return, and so that that could follow this this trend. But since this is only we only have six years of data here, actually, so or seven years, so um, there is a need to continue this, this population estimate so that we can see how this progresses in the future. Okay, so I don't know how this is going to work. Um, to show this video because some folks don't have internet, but we'll just go ahead and for folks that can't get to it, here's the link anyways. Um, so we can, you know, maybe Mary, let me know if this is not coming through. Okay, we'll do. Net, like, yeah, the whole net is totally filled up, you know, and you're like, 
talking about. And that's what this is, winter blues, this winter. That's Sonny Williams. I love Smoke Hooligan. It was cheese for all these times that the fish gave us. Everyone was be able, was able to kind of see that, but it's, it's not um, the presentation. So, yeah, feel free to check it out. Um, and a lot of it was just kind of a review of earlier in the presentation, but um, there's some really nice photos in there and video shots. So that's always fun to see. Um, so that that was the mark recapture portion of the research and kind of this new um, new age we're doing is aquatic environmental DNA or eDNA as it's kind of been been dubbed. Um, and this is looking at taking a, a water sample and determining a quantity from that. So quantifying the abundance in some sort of way that would be relevant to management. There's a little um, photo here with a little frog in the in the middle. So you'd, you'd imagine in a pond setting like this, you could pretend that that frog is a hooligan instead. They're swimming around in there. They are shedding DNA. Their feces, their um, scales, their the one got chomped by a sea lion, and so they're losing some. Um, but either way, DNA is being shed in the water. Um, so if you are able to take a water sample of that, you're able to collect the DNA. And so this is what we're doing through a sample. And then you filter that down, and um, then the DNA is compressed on the filter. And so this is some of the, the initial uh, studies. There's, there's definitely quite a few more now out there to use environmental DNA to get a quantity index. Um, some sort of estimate of biomass. And so oh, this is what we, um, we've had four years of data on this now and proven pretty effective. Um, so DNA concentrations, ability to detect the species definitely is affected by a couple different key variables. So the variance in the amount of DNA that is produced well, can vary through time and through different species, and so um, that kind of needs to be accounted for. Since we're using the same spe same species and we're taking daily samples, we can kind of um, yeah, we can kind of uh, negate that variable. There's also DNA degrades over time and different um, also with exposure to to UV light or to higher temperatures, and so we are filtering them down and keeping them cold and keeping them refrigerated until we're able to process them. And so we're able to kind of deal with the degradation rate also. The, um, the other variable that kind of throws more of a, a wrench in things is the dilution factor. Um, so as you kind of look in this background, this is the, I believe this is the mouth in Berners Bay. And the, when you're dealing with these large glacier, glaciated systems, they're very braided, um, get some sort of dilution factor, some sort of flow measurement of how much water is in that system has been has definitely been challenging. Um, working on ways to overcome it. And so this is the area that we are now collecting eDNA methods in. And so we have the um, kind of the upper left there, we have the Chilkat, that is a very, very big braided system. The Chilkoot, which we've seen, um, that's a very straightforward, easily weightable system and has a stream gauge on it. So that getting flow data on the Chilkoot is very easy. Ferebi, um, which will system again. Mataya and Skagway, we can have flow data. Um, and then we're also working on the Cassahine. Burner's Lace and Antler and Burner's Bay and the Eagle and Mendenhall Rivers. And so, yeah, basically these large 
glaciated systems, getting flow measurement has been the biggest challenge. And the, but it's, that, it's not something that isn't overcomable. Um, but compared DNA concentration among rivers, we would need a pretty um, accurate flow measurement so that we can for flow within each river. Um, but if that's not possible, we'll still be able to uh, develop a, a trend within that river based on stage height. So that's kind of what we're looking at now if we can't get accurate flow data. So this is us collecting flow data on the Ferriby River spring. And pretty much right after this photo was taken, we realized that the tide was coming in, watering our flow area. And so can't get a flow measurement when it's backwatered. Um, we also, it's hard to also get up in there with a jet boat when, um, when you, you kind of need the tide to get you in, but it's also, you need to time it so that you can take your measurement before it gets too high up. Um, the interesting challenges that we were faced with overcoming by expanding the study. Um, the other one is if it, it's, the tide is too low, then your jet boat gets stuck. So um, just another thing to consider. And then you have to push your jet boat out for quite a ways. <laughs> Um, but so here is the uh, comparison on, between the marker capture method and eDNA for the Chilkoot River. And as I mentioned, the Chilkoot is, is by far the easiest system to work on. It is gauged. It's easy to get accurate flow measurements. Um, it's also easy to, to run the marker capture method on the Chilkoot. And um, yeah, so let's kind of I'll just follow this a little bit. So in 2014, that is the, the big, the tallest blue point on here. And so that shows there is uh, the most amount of DNA in 2014. There's also the biggest population estimate from the mark recapture in 2014. 2015 was um, pretty much a, and the Chilkoot, there's a very small returning run on, uh, on the Chilkoot in 2015. And the DNA concentrations also reflected that. And then to kind of the third point and all that to really validate this method, in 2016, we got a, a moderate return through the mark recapture, and we also got a moderate um, amount of DNA concentration. And an interesting thing that you can see with the um, kind of the trimodal pattern of the DNA concentration is the DNA concentration method might be more accurate than the mark recapture method. And so um, in 2016, the run was, was really unusual. It was, there was a bimodal run, even um, just naturally the fish. So we had a one peak that came through, and that's what is estimated here with the mark recapture. Four or five day run, um, and then there was a, a lag um, where there was no fish in the river for about a week. And, um, Maybe it wasn't a full week, but about five days. And then we had a large second pulse of fish come through, which is not shown in the marker capture. At that point, the water had risen too much and we had to pull the trap. And so we didn't get that second pulse documented in 2016 in the marker capture. Still taking eDNA measurements, we were able to capture it through eDNA. Um, and then I believe that this second pulse here. Yeah, could be just some, uh, some lag behind of, of other individuals coming up. But so that was really interesting to see that the, the eDNA method could be actually um, more accurate, potentially, than marker capture. Um, OK, so that is kind of our, our population estimates right now. I also mentioned that we're doing a little CPUE catch per unit effort that is happening kind of um, the last year on the Cassian River, just to get some sort of quantity index to compare the eDNA data to. Um, it's also happening on the Tyre River. They're doing some catch per unit effort there. Um, so we don't have the, that data totally analyzed yet, but um, of all these different methods to be the most effective. And, and it'll most likely depend on what system we're working in. 
But so for the climate vulnerability uh, portion, um, this was a big piece of emphasis behind the Choku Indian Association to looking at uh, monitoring the fish. They also really wanted to assess what the climate um, vulnerability of Yula Khan. So through that, we established a tribal working group with um, different leaders and elders. And they shared and we, we listened to um, the different trends that they've seen over the years in hooligan spawning and um, how it changes from river to river. Maybe sometimes it's bigger on the Chilkat versus the Chilkoot and changes between those two rivers. And we documented that. The tribal working group was also trained um, in the, uh, the LEO, the Local Environmental Observer Network Protocol. This is a, um, I think it's a really interesting network. And if you guys have, if you ever just, I'm just check out some of the different observations. But the LEO network um, trains observers to document unusual or unprecedented occurrences. And so if there's a mass mass die off of a certain bird or, um, or fish that maybe has not been documented before, birds will go and, and input that data into the LEO network. And um, yeah, so the tribal working group was trained in this and as well as the tribe's environmental staff. And so that they can um, help document and, and also be able to um, recognize some of those very different things that might be happening. Um, and so we also talked with the tribal working group about changes in, in temperature and in precipitation. And it seems that Southeast Alaska will see a, I think it was documented that it would be the greatest um, increase in temperature regionally, or maybe across Alaska, um, a lot of the, um, has the potential to change snowpack levels, which could influence stream levels, um, especially during that spring melt-off time, which um, pre hooligan could play a big role in which rivers they do spawn in. Um, also, beginning to look at is um, what are some of those environmental characteristics among the rivers within a region that um, might go to Yulikon spawning. spawning. Um, so is it a water level thing, a temperature thing, involved oxygen? Um, what are some of those criteria? So we looked at this as a tribal working group. And kind of the, the biggest takeaway was that the lack of baseline knowledge was the greatest threat to the Yulikon population, especially in the near term, and especially that lack of understanding the population dynamics across rivers. Um, so that was, um, that was, yeah, the big takeaway from the working group. And that is also what is to pursue this population monitoring and expand it and um, be able to, to test these different methods and determine which would be most appropriate across the region. So that is all I have for you today. I want to thank all of the project partners, um, to the Indian Association, um, the Klondike Gold Rush National Park, Taya Inlet Watershed Council in Skagway, University, and then our funding um, organizations as well, obviously, the, and the Alaska Climate Science Center. And our current funding is through the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So, um, yeah, that's all I have for now. Thank you guys so much. I don't know if there, is there time for questions? Yeah, this is, yeah, this would be the question and answer session. Question and answer session. Okay. Great. How, how does that usually do? You, do you want me to facilitate? Yeah, I'm getting an echo here. I can go ahead. I can go ahead. Well, uh, uh, is there anybody? Yeah, else? Is there anybody else? I, I have one question. When you clip the pins, does that affect the swim? Oh, sorry. Can you say that one more time? When you clip when you the pins, does that affect the fish's swimming? Um, and that's a a big. Um, yeah, it's a big question. 
with a lot of studies that um, clip adipose fins, in particular for hatcheries that clip adipose fins on salmon. Um, we, we don't know that there is an impact, but we don't know that there's not an impact. Presumably, it's such a short distance that they're traveling that it, it wouldn't have a large impact on them, but um, it has been, it's been done in other studies, so the, the precedent has, has been there for that method to work, but um, it has, has looked at the, the true impact of, of clipping an adipose fin. But, but yeah, it is, it's an interesting concern. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Are there any other questions? The room in Anchorage, perhaps? Yeah, I've got a Yeah, I've got a Okay. So okay. So I'm wondering. I'm wondering. With mark recapture, you're dealing recapture, with, you're dealing uh, with um, some assumptions. Some assumptions. And you're looking at cross populations. Population. And so and you're so assuming you're, that there's no migration or emigration. You're assuming, you're that, assuming that, that the tag retention, tag retention is. is 100% really good. Really good. Um, um, how would you deal with you those deal for your analysis? Those are some. Those are some. Um, so it's, it's built into the, uh, and so I could go back and show that, I believe. But there's, there's a very large um, for this data. Um, so I think you can maybe see it here, and uh, that we we don't recapture all of the the clipped fish. Um, we we can get some, but but yeah, we definitely don't recapture all of them. And yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of room for uh, possibly uh, overestimating over some of the fish are escaping escaping your sampling your target, sampling and so you're and not so you're necessarily catching or catch searching all the fish that are tagged or tagged. Maybe I'm saying that wrong. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a source of error. Um, we also have active fishing going on while this while the mark recapture is happening, and so. Where we're, we're clipping fish and re-releasing them back into the stream, and then, you know, the 20 stream, there's active subsistence fisher folks there, um, you know, potentially catching just a lot of the, the fish that are clipped. And because this is such a, a cultural species, we can't necessarily ask them to move. Um, but we just kind of try to. Ish, release them further in stream, um, but yeah, th there's a lot of a lot of sources of error with the mark recapture method. It's, it's definitely not not totally perfect. Um, there's a lot of fish that are taken out of the in subsistence fishing, um, like truckloads of fish that whole beds of truckloads filled with fish. <laughs> So uh, we try to go through as many of the, the subsistence fish as we can, and that's how we are able to get um, some really big recapture numbers. But, but yes, yeah, that's definitely a source of error. How to, how to really overcome it yet, though. So if you guys have any suggestions, that would be, would be really great to hear. Yeah, 